أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد ما صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وروحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقطة من لساني يفقه قولي So dear brothers and sisters, welcome to day five of our lecture series on Nabi Lut. We learn from the Holy Quran that there's lessons to be learned in their stories. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي قَصَصِهِمْ عِبْرَةِ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ There are lessons in their stories for people of deep intellect and people of understanding. So brothers and sisters, we want to use these nights, these days and these nights, first and most importantly, to improve our relationship with Allah, our Creator. Secondly, we want to improve and ready ourselves to serve our Imam, inshallah, to be the soldiers of our Imam. Now, what we're going to be doing is we'll be covering some of those topics that I had shared before. Now, we weren't able to cover the topic of ideological bravery properly yesterday. So inshallah, we'll focus tonight on that. And then those other lessons, inshallah, we'll cover them as the nights go on. Please send a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One of the important points we learned from last night was this. Islamophobia is not new. This is an old tactic which has been used by the enemies of Islam from the beginning of time. We learn from the words of God in the Holy Quran, Surah 43, verse number 7, where he says this, وَمَا يَأْتِيهَمْ مِن نَبِيٍ No prophet would come to them, إِلَّا كَانُوا بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ They would mock that prophet, they would mock his religion, they would mock those who followed him. So this weapon of Islamophobia, getting believers to apologize, to feel uncomfortable as if we're doing wrong. Whenever a terrorist act happens, the believers on the backpedaling, apologizing, this is not Islam. This is a tactic that's been used in the past. What is our counter move? What's the antidote to the poison? That's what's important. The antidote is going to be that ideological bravery. Ideological bravery. What happens is, Amir al-Mu'mineen has taught us never to apologize for upholding the truth. If we want to be like Ali, we can never apologize for upholding the truth. He said it to us in this hadith, لا تعتذر من أمرا أتعت الله فيه Never apologize. Do not apologize when you're obeying God. Actually, that is an honor for you. It's a manqaba that you're obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if brothers and sisters remember, when we went over the definition that Imam al-Hasan gave us, he told us one important part of ideological bravery. And that is that we would exercise sabr, resist, that we would be patient when we're receiving criticism, slander, insult, that that wouldn't make us back up. That's very important for us as believers. Ideological bravery means that based on our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we're facing this kind of opposition, we tell them from the bottom of our hearts, we can do this all day, bro. We can do this all day. We're not changing, we're not different, whatever Allah says. Now, what happens is, this kind of ideological bravery starts with game-changing faith. فَآمَنَ لَهُ لُوت Lut changed, Lut came to his side, Lut was a spiritual heavyweight. We also, if we want to have that game-changing faith or that spiritual bravery, we've got to start with game-changing faith. The other thing we learned was this. There were two characteristics that we're supposed to have if we have that faith which is game-changing. If we have ideological bravery, how will it demonstrate itself? There were two characteristics that we were supposed to have. One of them was that firm belief 
in Allah's promises. That we can take God's promises to the bank. We count on God's promises. For us, God's promises are realities. As Allah says in the Quran, Surah 3, verse number 9, إِنَّ Allah la يُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ God never breaks His promise. إِنَّ Allah la يُخْلِفُ الْمِعَادِ The other trait which we also have to develop and make sure that we have is the idea of a willingness to sacrifice for Islamic principles. Not where they were doing this grudgingly. Actually, Amir al-Mu'mineen teaches us how we should be. And hopefully, by the right of Amir al-Mu'mineen, we're able to be like this. How should we be? Ideological bravery. The Imam says, leap into danger for the sake of truth. خُذِ الْغَمَرَاتِ لِلْحَقِّ Leap into danger for the sake of truth. So now, a little bit about what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do, brothers and sisters, is this. We would like our emotions, bravery, not having fear, standing strong, these are emotions. We want our emotions to be in line with the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to be under divine guidance. We want to feel as Allah wants us to feel, not as we want to feel. So the question that we asked yesterday, and we never got to explore, was what's the strategy? Is there a magic formula? Is there something we're supposed to do? Are there steps, practical steps, that we can take if we want to be those people who have that ideological bravery that can help us stand strong in this kind of a struggle? where it's of strategic importance that we don't back down from our Islamic beliefs? And the answer is yes. What I'd like to share with brothers and sisters is a two-part strategy. The first part that I'd like to share with my brothers and sisters is not as important as the second part, but it's very essential and very helpful. So a two-part strategy. Now, the two-part strategy is this. I remember hearing this for the first time from Sheikh Panahiyan. So I was in Qom, young student, attending the majalis, and I heard it for the first time from the shaykh. What he explained was this, that as believers, we have four enemies on our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to experience God's best. We want to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What are the challenges? What are the enemies? He explained that there's four. One of those enemies is the dunya itself. It's Darul Ghurur. The dunya tricks us. It fools us. It makes it difficult to go over and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he want to, as he wants us to. So one of our enemies is the dunya. The other enemy is Iblis, Shaitan, who was sworn to take us off the path. He wants to drive us away from experiencing God's best. So that's a second enemy, another powerful enemy. Iblis, someone we can't see, a jinn, all that experience, thousands of years old, and personal enemy of each and every one of us. So that's the second enemy, Iblis. The third enemy that we have is actually within all of us. Each and every one of us, not only do we have a different test, and our test, my test is different from your test, your tests are different from one another, each, of one, each and every one of us, in addition to those other two powerful enemies, one the dunya, number two iblis, the third one is our own nafs. We also have desires. We also have things that we want. The nafs. So that's three enemies. Iblis, the dunya, and also our nafs. But what happens is the challenge doesn't stop there. Actually, we have one more enemy. Who's the last enemy? The last enemy is actually stronger than the other three. More of a challenge than the other three. Who's the last enemy? Other people. Other people. Why are they more of a challenge than Iblis, than the dunya, than my own nafs? Other people are very real. Other people are right in our face. It's one time when I'm trying to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm struggling with my own nafs, I'm struggling with iblis, I'm struggling with the dunya. Another time, 
the person who's ruling is Saddam Hussein. Another person? Yes, all of us have a nafs, but it's different if you have a taghiya in your face. If there's punishment for obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stand strong and say, even though this person is standing in front of me, as Amir al-Mu'mineen says in that hadith about the awliya, the awliya look at the batin of the dunya, when others look at the zahir of the dunya, to say that still there is no power or strength save Allah, even though I see this tyrant facing me. So what happens is, other people actually form the biggest challenge. You and I can have effect on others. We want to make sure that the effect that we have on other people is the effect that God wants us to have. We affect one another. Sometimes what happens is you and I would like to have that deep ideological faith, that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fearlessly carry out our responsibilities. The challenge though is other people make us afraid. I want to be brave. I want to stand strong. I want to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then other people are in my face. Oh, you're going to do that? Doesn't look like a wise move. You know what the authorities will say? Other people scare us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in the Holy Quran. This is Surah 3 and verse number 175. He says, إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ That is actually only shaitan. يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ Shaitan makes his awliya, his friends, afraid. You and I are supposed to only fear God. Who is it that's coming to me, making me afraid of other human beings? What will other people think? What will they say? How can I get this job? Right? There's other people who make people bigger than they're supposed to be. They threaten me. إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانِ يُخَوَّفُ أَوْلِيَا Shaitan makes us very afraid. God doesn't want us to be like that. The remainder of the verse is a reminder about the realities of the universe. The rest of the verse, God says this, فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ don't fear anyone else. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِي إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Fear me if you're believers. Don't worry about the others. Worry about me. If I'm on your side, it doesn't matter who's against you. If I'm against you, the universe can't save you. Worry about me. Don't worry about them. But it's not so easy to make that step, that leap of faith. One of the things, back to the strategy. So one of the things that we'll keep in mind is that sometimes fear is contagious. I would like to be brave. I would like to be strong. But when other people are whispering to me, telling me, threatening me, telling me about the consequences of my actions, sometimes they're able to get to me. and I'm not able to be as strong as I'd like to be. It's so important, this principle. You know, because see, sometimes when you and I want to change a principle, we want to change a bad habit, we want to change a way of being, we have to be selective in our friends. We have to choose our friends carefully. Sometimes there's nothing I can do about certain company. It's my family. My spouse. Right? I can't do anything. That's the person I'm living with. But sometimes you and I are making a choice. God looks carefully at those we choose to have as friends. Those we want to hang out with. This is so serious when it comes to self-development that the hadith from our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Salawat please. He tells us, even when it comes to seeking advice, never take a coward as an advisor. Never take a coward as an advisor. 
Fear is contagious. The same way that we tell people who have just come out of jail, come out of jail, bad habits before, got messed up. We say, don't go out and hang out with your homies. They're bad news. They'll bring you back where you were before. The same way when it comes to even seeking advice. This hadith from the Prophet, he says, Ya Ali. So he's giving Imam Ali advice. He says, La tushawiranna jabanan. Never take advice from a coward. Never take advice from a coward. Why not take advice from a coward? The Prophet says, he says, فَإِنَّهُ يُضَيِّقُ عَلَيْكَ الْمَخْرَجِ You're facing a situation. There is a makhraj. There is a way out. There's a way of standing strong. There's a way of doing your responsibility. Because the coward is scared, the coward will make me think there's no way out. How can I stand? Right? Because he's scared. I'm scared, I make you scared. And s- we need to surround ourselves, brothers and sisters, with people who will speak words of faith to us, who remind us of Allah's promises, who will encourage us to do our responsibility. That's what we're looking for. If I'm st- constantly around people who they don't believe in Allah's promises, they will actually confuse me, make me think there's no way out, make me give up before I experience victory. So what happens is the first step is that we need to look at our company, surround ourselves with those who also are going to remind us of our responsibilities and Allah's promises. Make us believe His word. Speak words of faith to us instead of scaring us and terrifying us. In other words, brothers and sisters, if you and I would like to soar like an eagle, we can't always hang out with chickens. I heard a story once. They said once there was an eagle and was raised in a chicken coop. So, because that was all that it knew, the eagle would walk like a chicken, he would talk like a chicken, he would peck like a chicken. He thought he was a chicken. One day, the eagle was looking outside of his coop and he saw an eagle above, soaring in the sky. And the eagle thought to himself, he's like, I'd like to do that. His DNA was starting to wake up. I'd like to do that. I'd like to soar. He told his chicken buddies about his dream. His chicken buddies laughed and laughed. You're just a chicken. You're like us. Stay here where it's safe. You'll never be able to soar. But the eagle didn't listen to them. He said, you know what? I might look like, I might be, my circumstances might say that I'm a chicken, but inside I know I'm something else. I'm an eagle. I can do this. He even tried to learn to fly in his little coop. He would try to fly. His wings were bigger than the other chickens. He would try to flap his wings, and he would take little baby steps. He could barely lift off the ground, and the other chickens would laugh and laugh when he fell. He would go up against the, the coop. They would laugh. See, we told you, your chicken, stay here where it's safe. But he didn't listen to them. Them ridiculing him, mocking him, telling him, just because their vision was limited, it didn't stop him. He kept trying, and one day he did lift out of that coop. And then as he flew up in the air, he's like, I knew something different. I could be this. I could do this. So we can't always continue to hang out with chickens. They're narrow-minded. They don't see Allah's vision for them, Allah's plan. God wants me to experience something great. He wants me to be special for Islam. They want to be mediocre. They like it. Hanging around with the chickens will make us be like a chicken. The second part of this strategy is even more important than the first. The first part of the strategy was that when it came to Allah's creation, Allah's creation, we made sure to associate ourselves with those who would help us, those who would move us forward. Those would help us believe in Allah's promises and act on Allah's promises. The second part is not about Allah's creation. The second part, the reality of it is, we will try to fix our relationship with Him, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we want to become ideologically brave, we've got to fix our relationship with God, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salawat please. One of those key reminders that we need to have if we want to experience God's best is to remind ourselves and others that God is good. Allah is good. Imam Ridha tells us this. He says, Ahsana dhanna billah. Always think good of God. Tell yourself, God's good. He's on my side. He'll help me. He'll assist me. He sees. He's watching. Man aslaha ma baynahu wa bayna Allah. Aslaha Allah ma baynahu wa bayna nas. Whoever fixes his relationship with God, God will fix his relationship with the people. What happens is, when we look in our hadith, they tell us what the root cause of cowardice is. Why is it that some people are cowards when they should be brave? It's time for them to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take steps of faith, but they shrink back. Al-haya'u yamna or rizq as Imam Ali says. Sometimes Allah has an opportunity right there just waiting for us. All we have to do is take that step of faith. Be brave. Al-haya'u yamna or rizq I'm not able to be brave. I stop myself from experiencing God's best. Sometimes being brave means to spend in the way of Allah. This is one of those situations where now I should trust in God. Yes, my finances are like this, but this is one of those situations. Islam needs help. I need to spend in the way of Allah. Why is it some people, when they should spend in the way of Allah, they don't spend in the way of Allah? Sometimes it's not either of those two. Actually, it's the opposite. Sometimes the responsibility is to be content. The challenge is, go acquire more, push harder, get more. That's the challenge. But the reality is, Allah wants us now to be qani, not to be haris and greedy. What's driving me is not Islam anymore. It's greed driving me. What happens is we have a hadith from the Prophet, and he tells Imam Ali, he says, ya, he says, Wa'lam ya Ali, know this, O oh Ali. He says, Annal jubna, cowardice, wal bukhl, being stingy, instead of spending on the way of Allah, being stingy, holding back. He says, wal hirs, being greedy. He says that these are actually one trait the root cause of all of them is su'udhan. I think badly of God. Instead of me believing Allah's promises, spend and God will take care of it. Be brave, God has your back. Instead of me believing that, I don't believe Allah's promises. I'm scared. I can't trust Him. I have to have my own back. To have my own back. Who knows? I, I trust God. I go out on a limb. What's going to happen to me? Instead of, Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad, the Quran tells us, believe God, trust God. God never lies. Instead of that, I think if I trust God, He'll let me down. I heard a story that's not true, inshallah. It's definitely not true. It's not true, for sure. They said once, this lady, she had an accident, a near-death experience. Traumatic accident, she made it to the hospital. She made it to the hospital, she really thought she was going to go. She started talking to God, she has munajat, munajat, munajat with God. She said, God, is this it? And God told her, he said, no, it's not it. You're going to make it. You've got 40 more years. She said, oh, wow, alhamdulillah. So when she came out of the hospital, she said, I've got 40 more years. What did she do? She went and she got a tummy tuck, a liposuction. She got a stream makeover. I've got 40 more years to leave, live. And as she was walking away from the doctor's office, a truck hit her and she died. Subhanallah. She died and now she went back to God. She said, God, I thought you told me I had 40 more years. And God said, that's you? I didn't recognize you. 
The opposite of what Islam says, Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'at. God never lies. He's there for you. He's with you. So what Islam is, the ideological bravery, fixing my relationship with Him, thinking good of Him, expecting Allah's help, very important. Instead of the, I have to have my own back mentality. God has my back. Very, very important. Now, the next one, brothers and sisters, is advice from Amirul Mu'mineen. The advice of the Imam, it needs a little bit of explanation. First, let me share the Arabic of it, and then after that, the explanation. So what happens is, in order for us to experience ideological bravery, to be at our best, to stand strong, what we're going to need to do is to reset our beliefs based on those realities we find in Qur'an and Sunnah as taught to us by the itra of Rasulullah. We're going to have to reset those beliefs. Now listen to the Arabic of this hadith, the hadith of the Imam. This is what the Imam says. Beautiful hadith. He says, لا أشجع من لبيب لا you will never find someone who is ashja, more brave than a person who is labib. The easy translation, if we didn't have deep understanding, would be that the labib is intelligent. Someone of deep understanding. What's the deeper understanding? Brothers and sisters, when you look at our hadith, they tell us that you and I have two faculties. I'll put it in this way, I'll call it two faculties. Everyone has what is called the aql, the intellect. With the intellect, you and I make decisions. We weigh our options. We see what's the best strategy. What's the best approach? Everyone has been gifted with the aql. What happens though, if you and I think about it, if everyone's given the aql, and they're all weighing their priorities, trying to make the best decisions, why is it that we see uqala, wise people, making such terrible decisions? Everybody's got aql. Aql is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It helps me weigh my decision, figure things out. What's the right way? What's the best way? Long-term goals, short-term goals. Aql. The hadith tell us that you have two things. One of them is the aql that everybody has. The other is the lub. Now we'll understand labib, lub. What's the lub? What's the difference between the lub and aql? The lub, so everybody has the intellect. The lub, brothers and sisters, is your pure intellect, unfiltered or unblocked by two things. One of them are wrong beliefs, false beliefs, and secondly, negative emotions. What stops the uncle from working properly? Sometimes a person will have beliefs that are mistaken, not in line with what Quran and Sunnah teaches us, not in line with what we find from Rasulullah or his Ahlul Bayt. The beliefs are wrong. Negative beliefs stop me from experiencing God's best. They're false beliefs. They're not in line with the universe. The other one though, are those negative emotions that come in and instead of me being able to just use that pure intellect that I've been given because I get emotional, I'm not able to go over and weigh the decisions properly. So back to the hadith of the Imam. The Imam says this, he says, لا أشجع من لبيب You'll find no one who's more intelligent than the person who uses that pure and unalterated aql without negative emotions, without being blinded by false beliefs, labib. So now, what we're going to try and do is to become people who are labib. There's a second part of the strategy. How can we become labib? The road map, brothers and sisters, is to reset our beliefs to make sure they're in line with the haqa'iq and the realities of the universe. What are the things that Islam teaches us when it comes to our beliefs? 
the reality of how the world works. I want to share one of those verses for us to keep in mind. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. One beautiful verse of the Holy Quran is Surah 10 and is verse number 107. Surah 10, verse number 107. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us over here? That's so effective when it comes to ideological bravery. God says this in the Quran. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should visit you with an affliction, if God wants to harm you, if God wants you to have a setback, فَلَا كَاشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا هُو God is the only person who can remove that difficulty, who can change your fate. Nobody else can do that. It's only Him. It doesn't stop there though. God says this, وَإِن يُرِدْكَ بِخَيْرِ If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to experience some goodness, فَلَا رَادَّ لِفَضْلِهِ the forces of the universe, if they gather so you don't experience good, there is no person, no being, or beings who are a rod, who can deny you Allah's grace. God causes whoever of his servants that he pleases to experience his grace. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets us aware of this reality. The only person you have to worry about is me. Don't worry about the puppets. I'm the puppet master. Any good that comes to you through them is with my permission. Bi'idnillah. They can't do anything for you. It's all me. Our Prophet has given us a wonderful hadith. He says, if all... أَنَّ الْخَلْقِ فَلَوْ أَنَّ الْخَلْقِ كُلَّهُمْ If the creation all together, they got together to give you something. They wanted to benefit you. They wanted to help you with something. لَمْ يُكْتَبْ لَكَ That thing wasn't written for you. He says, مَا قَدَرُوا عَلَيْ They would not be able to do that for you. They wouldn't be able to give that to you, even if they all gathered and tried to do that for you. So, Having said that, one part of it was believing or readjusting our beliefs. The next part of it is the idea of the Ahlul Bayt have taught us this. Since you and I are well equipped for our mission, we have to harness our creative juices, right? Allah says in the Quran, لا يكلف الله النفس إلا وسها. How do I get out those creative juices? The Ahlul Bayt, their way is to teach you and I to block off logically every way of sin, to leave us only with the right way left. I'll give you one story, one hadith, and after that, we'll try and tie these beliefs together. So, a man came to the imam, the fourth imam, and he said that, I can't stop sinning. The imam said, I'll give you five pieces of advice. If you do these pieces of advice, you can commit as sinny sins as you like. What is the hadith, Ya Imam? He said, the first one is not to partake of God's rizq. Instead of Allah providing for you, let someone else provide. Number two, leave Allah's kingdom. Leave from the wilayah of God, where God no longer has control over you. Number three, go somewhere where God can't see you. No one can see you, God can't see you. Number four, he says, when the angel of death comes to take your soul, you refuse to allow the angel of death to take your soul. You stand up, you fight back. He says, number five is when the angel comes to throw you into the pit of hell, you refuse to go into the pit of hell. If you can do those five, you commit as many sins as you want. The Ahlul Bayt logically blocked off every other way but the way of God. The creative juices then come out. I then become creative. Now I'd like to tie all of this in with a story, a true story. 
Hopefully we can benefit from this story and help us to experience that ideological bravery. The true story is this. Once, before our leader became the leader, he was the representative of Imam Khomeini, and he had to go to a place called Dehlaran. When he was over there, his responsibility was to make sure or give an accurate report of the activities of the enemy in that area. So he went to that area, the representative of the imam. They go to the area of Dehlaran, and he has two individuals in the vehicle with him. One of them was the head of the elite revolutionary guards and his second in command. Second in command is telling the story. They also had a driver. They said, as we were over there driving, then what happened was that the enemy spotted us. When the enemy spotted us, they tried to attack. The enemy tried to attack, and the enemy starts attacking us from three directions. As the enemy is attacking us, the driver is trying to help us to escape. We're driving as fast as we possibly can, and the leader goes over and he stops the driver. He says, don't drive so fast. You're driving like a maniac. Slow down. The guy knocks his hand off. Why are you trying to stop me? I'm trying to escape. He said, if it's been written that we're going to be killed, we'll be killed. Relax, we're going to make it. They start driving again. As the enemy closes in on them, again the guy gets nervous. He starts hitting the, the pedal to the metal again, driving like a maniac. The leader tries to stop him. The guy who's telling the story says, I was actually at the back. And by this stage, I'm worried. Why won't he let him go? He said, I was looking at the leader. And this whole time he was just calm and dignified as the car drove as we were speeding along. We ended up making it out. When we made it out, the leader took the driver aside. He said, look, if Allah had written that we're going to be killed, we'll be killed. But we'll be killed in an accident. Or we'll be killed at the hands of the enemy. If Allah hasn't written it, even if the enemy closes in on us, God will make a way out. 